Good afternoon, everyone. I'm JC Warden, Head of Regenerative Design here at the RSA, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to today's online event. And I'm particularly looking forward today to talking to George Bombio. For many of you, I'm sure George will need little introduction. He's an author, journalist and environmentalist and has received great recognition for his work in protecting the natural world, including a UN Global 500 Award and, of course, writes a popular Guardian column. George is author also of a number of hugely successful books on environmental issues, politics, social justice, global justice, and the latest of which is Regenesis, Feeding the World Without Devouring the Planet, which is published today. And in the book, George explores how advances in soil ecology can move us towards a new future for food and our relationship with the planet, and reveals some of the really exciting initiatives and people who are already working towards this different future. And it's a really fascinating read, so I'm looking forward to delving into more of what's in the book with George today. If you're watching online and would like to join the conversation about the event on Twitter, then you're very welcome to do so using the hashtag RSA Food Future, or you can also join in on the YouTube chat too. So George, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you with us. Thanks so much, Josie. Really great to talk to you. Um, I'm wondering if I could start with, um, I guess, kind of grounding us a little bit, because I think what I came around, came away from with the book is this sense of really being rooted in the earth and on the ground. I think, and I'm talking now five floors up in a flat in London, but had a real sense of the soil and um, the kind of texture and the, the smell and the touch of it as well. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why soil matters so much and maybe what some of those differences in that kind of tactile um, and senses well, and experience told you about the places that you were visiting. It, it's, it is an amazing thing that you know, we rely on the soil for 99% of our calories, and yet we scarcely think about it. And in fact, we don't even recognize it for what it is, which is an ecosystem. And it turns out to be an ecosystem that's as diverse and abundant as a rainforest or a coral reef. It's absolutely swarming with life. I mean, really extraordinary numbers um, of, of little animals, uh, half a million under a square meter in, in some parts, especially in, in places like the UK. And, and it's the, the life of the soil which makes the soil. That, that, that's the thing which I think a lot of people haven't grasped and it's really essential to see that soil is a biological structure. It's like a wasp's nest or a beaver's dam, that it's, it's being created by the organisms that live in it, starting with bacteria, which use the carbon in the soil as cement to stick together the little soil particles and build homes for themselves, little capsules effectively in which they trap water and oxygen and and then the the little tiny animals in the soil turn those bacterial capsules into bigger structures and then the bigger animals like earthworms and ants and ants in this case are big animals um, they they turn those into bigger structures and it's fractally scaled so um, whatever the magnification you use um, it, the structure is the same, and this gives it this tremendous resilience. It, it makes it very tough and strong and flexible, and it means that it doesn't, um, in nature, get swept away by droughts and floods and you know the wind and, and the rain and the rest of it. But of course, if you start really hammering it and degrading it and damaging it, then it does. And, um, and it's on this understanding of the soil that I think we can build an entirely new understanding of how we could feed ourselves without devouring the planet. And you talk a lot about the sort of different experiences of being in different locations and the kinds of soils that you engage with. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the difference between the soils that you experience where they maybe it's been part of this kind of intensive agriculture system versus the ones where people are working on different ways of kind of regenerating that soil system. Yeah, yeah. So so, so in a healthy soil, um, when conditions are good, and at the moment, because it's been so dry, you won't see very much. But when, when the soil is damp and it's quite warm, um, it is just revelatory. If you take um, a, a reasonably strong lens, a jeweler's loop, I mean, it's something you buy it for, for six pounds online, a 40 times magnification lens, um, dig up a lump of soil and find the focal length. It's just, whoa, you, you, it's quite amazing. It's just there's little creatures scuttling around everywhere that are too small to see with the naked eye. But as soon as you're tuned in with this lens, it's like, Oh my God, what's that? And what's that? And, and, and you're seeing, um, in some cases, whole phyla 
I mean, you know, which is a massive group of life forms that you never even knew existed. Yeah, I mean, it's really an amazing thing. And, and all these weird shapes, you think, hang on, this thing's got 12 legs. What on earth has 12 legs? And then you look it up and find, oh my God, there's an entire group of life which has 12 legs, which I've never heard of. And, and it, it's, it's sort of magic. It's really an amazing thing. And you see these beautiful sights. It's like these little root hairs completely enmeshed with these tiny crystal fibers of the fungi which live inside the roots and then grow around them and help the, the root to, to extract minerals from the soil. Um, all these really extraordinary things under the soil. But then when you look at soil which has been really comprehensively trashed, which all too often unfortunately is the case um, in, in agricultural soils, where it's had particularly too much nitrogen for fertilizer because that can cause the whole structure of the soil to collapse because the bacteria which build the carbon structure of the soil, um, the nitrogen can cause them to burn through that carbon which is a cement which sticks everything together and then the whole lot just goes flomp and it becomes compacted and waterlogged and um, deoxygenated and plant roots can't thrive in it anymore. Um, you'll often see soil which has become really fragile, you know, and, and we now see many parts here in the UK, but particularly in the hotter parts of the world where the weather can be much more extreme, uh, where, you know, a big storm or a big drought um, turns the soil to, to mud or to dust and just sweeps a whole lot off the ground. And, you know, that, that doesn't happen if the soil is well structured and healthy and kept covered. But if you constantly hammering it by inappropriate plowing, by too much fertilizer, by leaving it uncovered during hard weather and the rest of it, then you are going to lose that soil. And we are collectively losing our soil. And in doing so, we're losing everything. Because everything, you know, the reason you're here today and I'm here today and everyone else is here today and most of the living world is here today is because of soil. And it's this tiny, this tiny thin layer between rock and air on which everything depends. And yet we treat it like dirt. Why do you think that is? Because I think that's so fascinating for people who are not probably you know, in, involved in farming or agriculture in any way. The feeling that that is at the root of you know a root of everything, but it yet seems to be the thing that people are not paying attention to. Why do you think that's happened? Well, we all have blind spots. You know, we we all sort of get guided by other people. We're much more subject to what other people do and think and the way they look at the world than we think we are. You know, we we always we have this illusion that we 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 create our own minds and we we sort of independently come to our conclusions, but actually. You know, we are really guided to a very large extent by our social environment and that forms our mind to a very large extent and 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 the the biggest issue is the blind spots you know it's it's it's, it's not that we're seeing most things and um and missing a few we're seeing tiny spots of light you know we're concentrating on a few tiny issues and missing almost everything and you know this isn't unique to soil I mean, it, 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 there's so many aspects of our environmental crisis that we're not looking at at all. So it's hardly breaking the surface of public consciousness and yet are a million times more important than the stuff which is dominating the news. And, and we, we just sort of go down railway tracks and, and we're sort of driven down them to a large extent by the sort of dominant discourse in, 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 in any society, which is dominated still by the mainstream media. You know, if Rupert Murdoch doesn't think soil is important, most people end up not thinking soil is important. And that is a fundamental problem. Mm. And it, you talk a lot as well about that sort of disconnect maybe that people have with the environment around them, maybe many of us growing up and not having that kind of experience of soil. But it's also amazing how, how you can see now how animated you are around it and how exciting it is once you kind of delve into it. So I'm wondering too, if there's anything that you think that kind of complexity, because you look, talk a lot about the complexity of soil and it's, um, there are interrelationships between things there. Is there anything you think we could learn as a society too about how we're working together that, that soil could kind of teach us beyond kind of just the the way that we're growing things as well yeah so so getting to grips with soil and, and it did take me a while you know I, I did a huge amount of research to try to once I became enthusiastic it's like I wanted to know everything and I read all the latest papers and and I, I could have literally taken a degree in it by the time I'd done my research but 
it's um, um, one thing it taught me was the absolutely critical importance of complex systems. And we're never taught complex systems at, at school. You know, we, we, we come out of school with a completely mistaken view of the world. Because um, you know the, the teaching system seems to believe that oh you couldn't possibly get your head around complex systems so we'll teach the world as if it were a simple system as if it were like an electrical circuit or or a, a wash basin filling up with water and you've got a tap and you've got a plug hole and 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 that's it in out water level depends on that but complex systems like soil like human society like the global financial system like the atmosphere like the oceans like the forests like living systems like every single darn thing which is important the human brain the human body all of them are complex systems operate on completely different principles and uh, they're, they're self-regulating self-organized they have these emergent and adaptive characteristics which means that you can't predict how they're going to behave just looking at the components in isolation they operate on a totally different basis to simple systems but there are some sort of fundamental rules as to how they operate, which are just as easy to teach as the rules of an electrical circuit, for example. Um, but we don't teach them. And so we have no conception of how stuff works. And, and, and what we then end up doing is trying to impose simplicity on complex systems, whether it's a government saying, you know, I'm going to treat this phenomenally complex system called a society as if it's something which can be governed from the center by central diktats from the top down and and we can just have linear outcomes coming from the policies which i'm going to introduce without any reference to the people except once every five years when they put a cross in a box and we uh, and someone else gets into power anyway and so you know it's like it it's of course that's going to go wrong because you're treating a complex system as if it were a simple one um, and, you know, without the deliberative, the participatory democracy, which, you know, could actually respond to social complexity, um, you're going to get um, just bad stuff happening and, and democracy effectively failing. Um, and, and it's the same with our conservation efforts, you know, with the, the classic British approach to conservation is saying, right, here's our nature reserve. Within this nature reserve, the grass should be 10 centimeters high. The following shrubs should be present. The following should be absent. These species should be here. These species should not be here. And you're treating it like something you can manage from the top down, a simple system. It's not like that at all. Ecosystems are incredibly dynamic. They have these, these remarkable properties which just can't be predicted in that way. And what happens when you try to treat them as simple systems is you find that they're losing species, they often very prone to, um, uh, to fragility, that they get hit by climate events or other external issues, and they collapse. And whereas, you know, to allow nature to be nature, you've got to sit back and not try to control it all the time. I mean, reintroduce missing elements, but then to the greatest extent possible, say right let it get on with it and, and you know what nature's been pretty good at doing that um, um, for for the last 4.6 billion years um, uh, as a friend of mine says how did nature cope before we came along <laughs> yeah i think that's spot on i think that feels like there is this it feels like this emerging um interest in the, in this kind of complex systems and that feels like a real shift in consciousness for us to think like actually the way we engage with these needs to be really really different um but i wonder if, if, if we apply that to kind of farming how have you seen us maybe try to apply that simplification onto these these really complex living systems that that the farming industry engages with well the great global simplification is a real threat to our future food supplies because what we've seen is the development first of a global standard diet and the global standard farm which both supplies and drives that diet and the global standard corporation which governs the behavior of the global standard farm and the global standard ecosystem which is created by that global standard farm including the global standard river which has got almost nothing living it in it except sewage fungus because of all the nutrients pouring into it and and this is a highly fragile system so if you look at the collapse uh, or the near collapse of the fi financial system in 2008, which was only averted by this massive bailout, it happened because the financial system had lost its systemic resilience. Um, and, and the reason for that uh, is that 
as in any complex system, if your nodes become too big, in other words, in this case, the banks became too big and they're too well connected to each other and they start operating in synchrony, then any external disruption will be multiplied and magnified through that system. And, and the self-regulating properties of the system, which in, in, when, when that system's in a, in a resilient state, um, help to stabilize it and, um, and, and prevent disaster. In a situation like that, where it's been made fragile by um, that, those changes in structure, it can very quickly pass its tipping point and slip into a completely different equilibrium state from which you can't bring it back. Now, if you look at the structure of the global food system, you have four corporations controlling 90% of the global grain trade. You have similar concentrations in the agrichemicals trade, the meat trade, the seed trade. This is incredibly dangerous and, and their behavior is synchronized. There's even more mergers and acquisitions in, in the pipeline. They, they're, they're meshing into a network of networks with uh, using finance, financialization, IT and the rest of it. This is super fragile. And what we've seen is, is a hunger decline from the 1960s until 2014. And everyone was saying we're, we're envisaging the end of global hunger. But then from 2015 until the present day, chronic hunger around the world has been rising, the number of people who are chronically hungry. And it's not that there's a shortage of food. There's loads of food that is not necessarily going to the right places. But what, what we're seeing is systemic instability beginning to, to, to reveal itself. And so you get a small um, 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 issue uh, like, you know, the disruptions in 2008 and 2011 were classic examples. And that then gets magnified by the, the, the corporate structures of the food system. Um, the extremely um, high, high volumes of trade passing through a few very small nodes, um, speculation and financialization leading to this sort of now really crazy food futures market where, you know, the same wheat bushel of wheat might be traded 200 times uh, before anybody eats it. Um, and, you know, futures markets want stabilized prices, but they get beyond a certain point and they destabilize prices. And suddenly food is pushed out of reach of people because it becomes too expensive. And we're seeing this happen more and more often this year. It's now happening again. The external disruption being the war in Ukraine, um, the drought in India and Pakistan, well, the great heat wave in India and Pakistan um, is, is going also to have very serious impacts. And, and, and we see a system not being able to cope with those disruptions. And you know a system is approaching a tipping point when its outputs begin to flicker. And when you look at global food prices, food availability, um, food trade volumes and the rest of it, you see a great flickering of outputs. We're, we're coming close to the possibility of that food system doing what the financial system very nearly did in 2008 and flipping and collapsing. Now, financial collapse is bad enough. Collapse of the global food system. Now we're talking real massive hazard to humanity. Yeah, so the, the kind of complexity, if we're not understanding it properly and not looking at what is needed in those healthy systems, that mm. kind of, I think the way you describe that flip is, is so powerful because that sense of it being hard to come back from and how we're we making sense of those. And I think the, again, the description of the like global standard farm mm. is, again, a really powerful one, that sense that we've tried to kind of efficiency drive everything, homogenize things. So I guess thinking a bit more about what the alternative could be, um, you talk a little bit as well about the the difference of place that we, you know, if we get once you get down to soil, climate, terrain, etc., we realise that you know places are not the same. They are very very different, and that's how traditional diets and cuisines have reflected some of those. So, how do you think we manage this tension of sort of changing this global standard farm system um, to work a bit more from those differences of place and land, but also recognising that I guess that that relates to kind of people and culture and language and stuff too. Yes. yes. So I, I think the first thing to say is that there's no going back to the traditional diets and traditional farming patterns of, of the past. And the reason for that is that they simply were not providing what is required. Um, they weren't providing for, for, for the global population at the time, let alone for 8 billion now, for 10 billion by perhaps the middle of the century. Um, um, we, we do need a, a, a food system which is radically different, both from what we've got today and from what we had yesterday. 
but it's a food system that has to reintroduce redundancy and circuit breakers and backup systems and modularity, all the things which have been stripped out and which have made this current food system much less resilient and much more prone to, to, to collapse than it is. But also we need one which is going to stop destroying our life support systems and stop being destroyed by the collapse of our life support systems because climate breakdown is a very major threat now to our food production. So for instance, um, 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 one extra degree of global heating dries out 32% of the planet, according to one estimate. Um, um, by mid-century, we could see an, a continuous arc from Portugal to Pakistan, absolutely crucial food producing region of the world being taken out by drought simultaneously. Um, we um, see extreme weather events trashing food production left, right and centre. Um, it, it, we, we, we're looking at, you know, it's very hard to see how the current system could continue to feed us in, in those circumstances. So we need a system which reintroduces diversity. Um, that doesn't mean that everything must be locally traded. Um, we can't survive purely on local food production. The minimum distance over which the world's people can be fed, according to one paper, is 2,200 kilometers. And the reason for that is we tend to live in big cities and most of the farmland tends to be um, in remote, sparsely populated regions like the US Midwest, the Canadian prairies, um, interior of Brazil, um, Russian steppes, the, um, um, and of course parts of Ukraine too, where there aren't many people living, but there's vast tracts of agricultural land. Without that, we would starve. So, so, so we can't um, localize all farming. I mean, obviously where you can, it's a good thing to do, but you can't rely on that. But you can localize the way in which farming happens. Um, so in other words, it, it, we need a, a farm system which is far more responsive to the peculiarities of the soil, of, of the climate, of the amount of water available and, and the rest of it, rather than this imposition effectively of this global standard farm by your huge seed chemical corporations of, often supported by governments, all of whose extension work and development work is basically pushing the same model. Um, and and, and what that requires is a far more fine-grained knowledge. So one of the things I call for in the book is an Earth rover program. We've got a Mars rover program. We're spending billions investigating the surface of another planet, yet we scarcely know anything about our own. And using remote sensing technologies and a whole load, load of other very interesting new technologies coming online, we can get a much better picture of the state and condition of soils, um, uh, of what's going on under the ground, and from that we can we can work out what the minimum intervention you need is to raise your crop production on on any particular place and it'll be different in different places so if we get that right we can greatly reduce the amount of inputs we use whether it's fertilizers pesticides herbicides animal manure whatever it might be um, or in some cases, uh, and this remarkable um, um, horticulturalist, uh, vegetable grower I followed, um, Ian Tolhurst, has shown you can do without them all together and still raise your fertility and your yields. Um, it's, it's not easy, um, but he, he's proved the model. It can be done. Um, after, it took him 34 years to get it right, but he's, he, he's, he's, he's done it. It's an extraordinary achievement. How replicable it is, you know, remains to be seen. But but there's, but you know, it's about minimizing our inputs, minimizing our impacts, making the system more resilient, making it much more climate proof than, than it is at the moment. But also, crucially, and I, I expect we'll come on to this in a moment, taking a very large part of food production out of farming altogether. Yeah, and so yeah, I guess coming on to that was that. I think that question of scale feels so important because we've been so used to that scale always being about you know creating big efficiencies looking at how we can kind of have one size fits all in lots of places but you're arguing that there needs to be less land use for farming which is around um, taking out as you say meat and dairy production but then using that kind of high yield low impact approach to vegetables fruit cereals um, proteins fats could you tell us a little bit more about what that might look like um, sure. Because obviously it's very different to the to the system that we have currently. Sure. So so yeah, people 
quite rightly are really concerned about the current system and you know what a complete car crash it is you know it's, it is a really really dangerous unsustainable destructive system that we currently have for producing the great majority of our food and the standard response to this is to say we must either localize um, the system and as i say you can't localize the whole system or we will starve to death or um, to um, say we don't like intensive farming let's go for extensive farming instead now, by definition, extensive farming means using more land to produce the same amount of food. And land use is or should be the crucial environmental metric, because the land we use for farming or any other extractive industry is land which is not set aside for, for forests, for wetlands, for savannas, for, for all the other absolutely crucial habitats on which the great majority of the world's species depend, and on which we depend for the stabilization of Earth systems. Um, and so if you sprawl across the world using more and more land to produce your food, we, we destroy ourselves and our living planet just as effectively, probably more effectively than we do by having intensively farmed areas doused with huge quantities of pesticides and, and, and herbicides and fertilizers, which is also you know, a, a disastrous model. Neither of those is going to get us through the 21st century. And, and it's like, I find it really irresponsible where people just make this call for it and say, we don't like intensive farming, we want extensive farming without thinking it through, and without doing the numbers. You know, the problem is not the adjective, it's not intensive farming or extensive farming. The problem is the noun. It's farming, which above any other thing we do is trashing the planet. It's it's the, the major cause of habitat destruction, of biodiversity loss, of extinction. It's, it's up there as one of the um, top causes of climate breakdown, of water pollution, even of air pollution, which is something we don't really think about. And, um, and, and you know, I'm not saying we do away with farming, we've got to radically change and reform it. But there is a major part of the farming system we don't need to do anymore. And that is producing fat and protein, which is basically animal farming. And the reason for that is that there is now a far more efficient um, and far less damaging way of producing fat and protein, which is precision fermentation. So you basically take protein and fat out of the farming system, which, which effectively eventually means no livestock, no soya, no palm oil, and, and, and quite a lot of other products, and you take it into the factory. And in doing so, you have a far smaller land area, far smaller resource use, um, far smaller energy use, everything is minimized. And you can tailor food much more closely to what the human body needs, and produce a whole new cuisine, a vast new range of foods, most of which we can't even conceive at this point, any more than the first people to domesticate a wild cow were thinking of camembert. And I think it's such a it's such a powerful argument and such a but also such a challenging one too, because it's so different to what we currently have. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the um, the examples that you saw. That, with it kind of, to kind of bring that to life in practice because mm -hmm. um, obviously there are people people looking at this in very different ways already it's not a kind of far off vision there are people no, who no. are acting on it today yeah so so it's really simple technology we're talking about we're talking about brewing you know and people have been doing brewing for several thousand years now and um and they basically have microbes re uh, multiplying in vats and producing the things you want and it's like beer and bread for example or cheese and and in this case um uh, it's the microbes itself which is what you want um and and those microbes are tremendously productive so i um looked for example at this um um, um, business in Helsinki, in Finland, where they are using a soil bacterium, um, um, Cupriovides necator, which is, is hydrogen oxygenating. It's a really interesting thing. It, it, it doesn't use photosynthesis or any of the products of photosynthesis. It doesn't rely on what plants are produced or anything like that. Um, it, it, it combines hydrogen with oxygen um, and, um, and carbon dioxide from the air. And in doing so, um, it makes its own food. And, um, and, and that's all you need. You need hydrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, water, and a sprinkling of nutrients. And, and that is your total input. So it's basically electricity, water, and a bit of nutrients. And, and the, 
and and so um and and you get these bacteria multiplying every 20 minutes um you know doubling every 20 minutes what comes out the end is basically flour it's a very high protein um, um golden flour uh, because it's high in carotene it's about 60 percent protein and um and i asked them to make me a pancake out of it i was the first and the first person outside the lab on this planet to have a pancake made from microbial protein and to do that they had to dilute it with wheat flour otherwise you would have made an omelet because it's so high in protein and the really spooky disturbing extraordinary thing is that it tasted just like a pancake exactly like a standard pancake it was like oh i can't i cannot believe this has not been made with eggs and milk um, and, 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 and it's, you know, and, and, and it, it's, I mean, it is, re it was really amazingly similar, but, but obviously pancakes is not the sort of the, the prime, the, the, the main aim of, of, of the game. You can then use these proteins and lipids being produced by these bacteria to make a huge, I mean, uh, I mean, an un un unimaginable range of foods, meat substitutes and milk substitutes are off, are, are obviously, going to be a first stop because um, um, people are attached to eating meat and milk and stuff but I they're certainly not going to be a final stop you know we, we're going to go way beyond that into a whole range of foods we haven't even thought of and you know already people are beginning to experiment with that and 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 think about that and I find that a very exciting prospect some people are absolutely horrified by I don't want to eat bacteria you say well got bad news for you you eat them with every meal <laughs> loads of them and in fact a lot of our food specifically and deliberately incorporates live bacteria such as um you know that sort of yellow slightly stinky stuff we make from milk called cheese that's made with live bacteria the whole quality of cheese comes from having live bacteria in it and people sell bacterial supplements and live yogurt and all the rest of it um because it's good for us and in fact even worse than eating bacteria you are bacteria. You're absolutely stuffed with them. Um, your cells are full of little organelles which are made from bacteria. Your your gut is full of bacteria. Um, you know, and, and, and if you look at this the other way around, if, if you say, right, imagine we were currently producing all our fat and protein from bacteria and someone came along and said, oh, I've got a better way of doing it. No, no, we're not going to do this. Let's shut down those food factories. Instead, we're going to domesticate some wild animals, right? Like a wild cow and, and a wild boar and a jungle fowl and, and this woolly thing in Mesopotamia. Um, we're going to domesticate these creatures. And yeah, we're going to turn them in, into food. Yeah, yeah, we're going to we're going to breed them. We, 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 we'll we'll sort of select them for certain characteristics. We'll separate the young from the parents. Um, we'll um, we'll pack them into barns. There'll be um, loads of them all put together. Obviously, you have to sort of cut the ends of the beaks off and castrate them and cut the horns and the tusks off and stuff. No, no, we can't afford anesthetic. Don't be silly. Um, and then and then we'll stun them and then we'll cut their throat and we'll chop them up into bits. Um, and you're going to love this. You know, yeah. And and then, oh, yeah. And we'll we'll the the, the, the cows, we'll, we'll get milk from them. Yeah. And we mix it with bacteria and it makes this nice sort of stinky yellow stuff. You're, you're so going to love this. Yeah. I mean, people would say I was mad. They say absolutely mad. Oh, you know, by the way, you would have to trash like sort of, you know, 30 percent of the planet's surface to to keep these creatures you'd only have to sell uh, kill 75 billion of them every year you know that would feed that would feed humanity with fat and protein this is i mean people would be absolutely outraged if we were to propose it that way around but they say oh bacteria that's disgusting i don't want to eat it <laughs> yeah that's really interesting and i think i guess that also gets into the heart of the sort of question around obviously food is sustenance but food is also identity and culture and history and maybe sort of that sense of what what is it to be human and how are we connect to the world um, and you talk a bit as well about well quite a lot actually about the sort of myths around farming um and the stories that we tell ourselves about farming um so yeah i wonder if you could sort of share a little bit about that and why that's such a challenge to us maybe thinking differently about where we could go in the future with food yeah yeah um so i i came to the really outrageous um um conclusion that one of the greatest threats to life on earth is poetry and um and and the, and the reason 
for this is, is that we have this sort of mythic poetic vision of farming which bears no relationship at all to the reality of farming but that governs our perceptions and governs governs our our, our politics governs the politics surrounding farming and, and it goes back a long way i mean i i, I blame theocritus who is this um uh, uh, um, he was born, brought up in Sicily, he was um, living in Alexandria, looking back with nostalgia in the third century BC um, to, to the, the innocent and pure life of the shepherds living in the Sicilian hills, by contrast to the seething, evil, corrupt cauldron of the city, and created this totally mythic golden age view of shepherds who do nothing all day but lie under the trees um, playing their pipes and telling stories and having sex with each other um, not doing any actual work and created this sort of so sort of lovely bucolic I mean that's where we get the word um, this bucolic vision of 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 animal farming and this was picked up by Virgil who sort of moved the action to Arcadia which is a real place as well as a mythic place in, in the Peloponnese, and um, and and had um, these uh, farmers, uh, these livestock farmers, basically yeah, doing the same thing, but in this case, much more allegorical as a sort of picture of an ideal society. You know, the ideal society is um, the good shepherd or the good ruler and the good sheep, which is the good subject, doing what they're told by the shepherd, and 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 you create a sort of vision. Of political harmony from this completely mythic vision of, of, of rural harmony. Now, at the same time, there was an almost identical tradition being developed in the Old Testament, um, generally by the descendants of nomadic pastoralists who had settled in the cities and were going on, woe to the bloody city, it all lies in corruption, the prey departeth not, um, and looking back with nostalgia to a completely mythologized vision of Abraham and his flocks, or indeed, you know, Abel the herder killed by Cain, the tiller of the ground, um, and and these two things merged uh, and partly through through the work of Virgil, who's seen by some Christians as a prophet because of the remarkable um, what seems so almost seems like a biblical prophecy in in his fourth eclogue. Um, and 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 then it gets picked up big time in the Renaissance, first of all, in, in southern Europe, it then migrates to England, gets massive here with Spencer, Marlowe, Shakespeare, many, many others. Um, are often full of sort of allegory, um, full of allegory and wit, and and a bit sort of a, a, ironic and self-reflexive, especially in Shakespeare's hands. If you think of as you like it, you know he really takes the piss out of the pastoral vision, while at the same time promoting it. Um, and um, and and this this forms what uh, the great cognitive historian Jeremy Lent calls a a a, a root metaphor. It's this sort of deeply implanted vision in our mind of what is good and pure and innocent versus what is corrupt and evil and then this gets picked up big time in the two media that count the most television and books for very young children so um i, I don't know if you've got kids but yeah you know, it used to drive me to distraction when, when my kids were, were very small because literally about 50 percent of the books were farmyard books farmyard tales and there was a rosy cheeked farmer one cat one dog one horse one cow one pig one chicken all living together as a family in harmony no indication obviously of why they were there and what was going to happen to them um, and this is a livestock farm you know this is it, it, they create the livestock farm it's a place of safety and comfort whereas you know, in reality I, I worked on an intensive pig farm it's a place of horror it is really a place of horror and yet we create this beautiful cozy image around it and that that's very influential when you're that young you know that that's that becomes your place of comfort and then if you take your kids to a farm it's always going to be a petting farm or you know one of these places which reifies that storybook idyll you know and you can you can give milk to the sheep and you can hold the little chicks and the rest of it nothing to do with what actually happens on real farms but you know that it, that's what implants in our heads and then there's tv yeah, you know, every blinking Sunday night. If the BBC were any keener on sheep, it would be illegal. You know, you've got all these all these programs about about sheep keeping and shepherding and all the rest of it, and these noble shepherds staring into the uh, into the distance and stuff. Uh, you know, they never show you how people actually make their living in these programs, which is filling out subsidy forms on the computer because there's no no money at all to be made from keeping sheep. A lot of money to be made from talking about keeping sheep, 
probably far more money than anyone is making from, from actually keeping them. But it just implants this vision of uh, this is this is good, this is pure, this is innocent, this is right, which is very deeply implanted in our in our minds and in our souls. Um, and and it's a story we tell against ourselves as largely urban people. You know, we're evil and corrupt. To look for something good, you must go to the countryside. The reality is, oh my gosh, you know, the, the, the politics of the countryside are really bleak in many parts of this country. You know, democracy is almost a dead letter. It's still a sort of highly differential. Uh, differential. Um, you've got dominance of landed factions is, is really deep and hard to challenge. There's a lot of nastiness if you try to challenge that. Um, the reality of farming is so different from what the TV programs show you. Uh, you know, and they don't show you the river pollution. They don't show you the cruelty towards many of the animals. They, um, they, they don't show you the insane economics, which just like, you know, none of this would exist if it weren't for farm subsidies. No, no upland livestock farming would exist at all. I mean, the average amount that an upland sheep farm makes in England is minus 16,600 pounds a year. All the rest is filled in by you and me, the taxpayer. Uh, all these realities are obscured from us. And so this mythic conception, I think is very dangerous if we're trying to understand where our food comes from and how it could be done better. I wonder if there's something e even sort of deeper than this too, that sense of like, what is it? What is it to be human and relate to the rest of the world? Because you talk a bit as well around the, the sort of difference between this like hunter gatherer societies, but then also there are um, examples of many indigenous peoples who have worked on the land in a way that was sustained over a period of time. Not saying that that's something we can necessarily go back to, but there was a sense that you know when settlers arrived, there was a like, oh, this is a it, pristine landscape, but actually it was something that had been co-created with humans over millennia. So thinking about like, what is it that we feel like we are part of and how do we relate to that differently? And I think, which I think comes back when you were talking about the, the sense that we need to, maybe we then we set land aside that's not being farmed. Um, that's also that kind of thing of well, what, what is the role of people within that landscape? So I wonder if there's anything you could say around what yeah. you see that role of people being sure. um, in connection to land um, that maybe is different to the way we currently have it. Sure. So you're quite right. I mean, there's no pure state. There's no ideal baseline where you can say this is the state of nature and humanity or this is the state of humanity and nature. I mean, there, there isn't there's nothing to go back to. And there's a lot we can learn from the past, but that's not the same as wanting to replicate the past. And, and, and we have to you know, th realize that as human beings, we created our systems and we can create them differently. And, and we can create them to meet the needs of the 21st century, rather than getting locked into visions which uh, you know, we're never rooted in, in reality in the first place, <laughs> you know, if, if you go back to Theocritus and Alexandria, um, um, but, you know, belong to previous eras. And, um, and we have very peculiar and particular and urgent needs in the 21st century, not least to avert the collapse of our life support systems. And so those are the ones we, we need to be responding to. Um, and, um, you know, what, what is the ideal state? now well obviously there's no ideal state but we can massively improve our prospects of survival by allowing very large tracts of the planet to rewild um, in other words a mass restoration of ecosystems why is that is because not only does that stall the sixth great extinction prevent the collapse of of of, of living systems which threatens our own collapse but it also can draw down a very significant amount of the carbon dioxide that we've already released in, in, into the air. Because when, when forests regrow, when marshlands recover, they um, um, capture and, and sequester a great deal of carbon, which, which is currently in the atmosphere. Um, and that is not in any way to say we mustn't also decarbonize our economies. We have to urgently to do that, very urgently indeed, to leave fossil fuels in the ground. But it's very hard to see how we can avoid climate disaster without also drawing down a lot of the carbon that's already in the atmosphere. And by far the cheapest, quickest and easiest way of doing that is ecological restoration. Um, and, and what the prospect of precision fermentation of taking fat and protein production out of farming can do 
is to enable rewilding on a far greater scale than um, has ever been contemplated before. Now, what does that do, coming back to your question, for the relationship between human beings and, and the living world? Well, you know, our, our perceptions of, of the living world have changed radically from one century to another. You, you know, we, we sort of, things we might have seen as threatening, we now see as threatened, um, um, ways in which we felt we had to dominate and conquer and suppress and control nature. We, we now feel we should take a much more humble approach to nature. It will change again and it will keep changing. And you know, that's got to be a good thing. Just, you know, as societies evolve, society's relationships with the living world should evolve as well. Um, I mean, I, I would love to see, you know, our relationship being governed by far more respect than we've shown for, for, for nature to date, by far deeper understanding of it, by our comprehension, um, that as John Muir says, when you try to pick out anything in the universe by itself, you find it hooked to everything else. And the understanding that these are complex systems, human society is a complex system. When complex systems interact, you get even more complex systems, you get a system of systems. Um, and only by trying to understand that system of systems do we really have any hope of, of getting through and surviving and thriving and prospering in this century and those that are to come. Thank you. And I think that comes back to, again, that complexity. How are we really embracing that? Um, I know we're running close to time, but I want to know if I can ask one final question, which is around, I guess, the economic model, obviously a big question that underpins this, but you talk a lot about ownership as well. And I think that feels like a really important point if we're thinking about how we're going to do this differently. Sure. So, so at the moment, we're in the midst of a, another phase of land grabbing where um, big corporations, sovereign wealth funds, um, investment groups are just seizing huge tracts of the planet, often from um, uh, highly impoverished people, often taking the best land and turning it away from um, um, the food which people need towards often what they call flex crops, which are um, crops which can be used for food or animal feed or biofuel, depending on where the market's going, and are often taking very large amounts of food out of people's mouths. Um, this is a disastrous trend, you know, we need we really need to see a much greater democratization of land use and, and what that means well it's different it's going to be different in different places but certainly far more social engagement with the question of who owns the land what are they doing who determines what they're allowed to do because it's not you know it's not like land is, is something which which appeared in someone's bank account land <laughs> land land was there before we got there and and what happens to that land is an absolutely crucial determinant of what happens to humankind and the rest of life on earth and so those decisions should not just be left to those who happen to own it. You know, it should be part of a societal discussion. And, and at the moment, there's this sort of tendency of landowners to erect a no trespassing sign, not just in front of their land, but in front of the discussion of the land. They say, are you a farmer? Well, you've got no right to talk about it then if you're not a farmer. You townies, keep out. No, sorry. Well, for a start, you know, you wouldn't be farming that land if we weren't paying for it, because uh, the great majority of farming is entirely dependent on farm subsidies you know it would not be happening in its current form and yet you know it's taxation without representation because we have no say whatsoever as to how that farming takes place and every so often there's a review of farm subsidies and and there's all these uh, lots of ngos and people say it should be like this it should be like that they're completely ignored and governments just do what the farming unions want. And it's, a, it's the same the world over. It's just again and again, it's like these completely dysfunctional systems are maintained or made even worse because the majority of society is shut out of those discussions. We urgently need to be allowed back in and to democratize the most crucial of all questions, which is how do we feed the world without, without devouring the planet? Thank you. And I, I knew this was going to happen. I feel like I've got so many more questions, but <laughs> we know we're playing close to time. And I, but I think that point on ownership around land, uh, decision making, but also ownership of the new models that you're talking about feels so important if we're really going to think about how it's not that centralised system, but really distributed. So Absolutely. thank you. Thank you so much. I know we've only just scratched the surface of everything that we could talk about. And there is so much research and so many um, fantastic examples too in the book. Um, just really grateful for you taking your time to share some of it today.
Um, so for those of you who are watching, I really encourage you to get a copy of the book Regenesis um, if you want to delve into a bit more detail about what we've been discussing today. And the book is out today and you can see details of how and where to find it in the chat. Um, so please stay tuned for more work from the RSA on our channels in the future and events like these. Um, and as ever, thank you to our fellows for supporting the work that we do. Um, and all that remains for me to say is thank you again to George Monbiot and to all of you for watching. Thank you very much, Josie. That was really great. I really enjoyed it. Good, me too. <laughs>